Hello, ladies. The Big Balboski here, and you're listening to another wrestling podcast. <laughs> it's time for uh, another wrestling podcast. Welcome, everybody, to another wrestling podcast. I'm Jonathan Benjamin. And I'm Steve Credo. And this is episode number 38. And I can you feel the – there's something different about this show today, Steve. I It's it's the love, Jonathan. Can you feel the love in the air? It, you know, it's Valentine's Day week on another wrestling podcast, and we wanted to spice it up for you, our listener. That's right. Uh, Joining us this week, we have the lovely Trina Michaels, former adult film star, current wrestling star. As well as the man who put Val in Valentine's Day, Val Venus. Wow, Jonathan. I mean, if if you guys are sitting at home and you don't have that significant other, uh, what better way to spend Valentine's Day than with us? A couple guys talking about uh, wrestling talking with former porn stars, former wrestlers who actually portrayed porn stars. Uh, I mean, I don't know. That's as close as we could get to, to the love aspect, I guess, of, uh, of this show. We are the total package, not Lex Luger, but uh, we, we do it all here on that's, another wrestling podcast. That's right, guys. So if we could do anything for you this week, uh, it's, I don't know. We're trying to give you some, some love, some love back. We want to give the love back, don't we? Yeah, absolutely. I think that this is going to be probably the best show we've ever done. So stu- just stay tuned and uh, just listen to these great guests we have today. Uh, I'm going to hold you to that, Jonathan, because, you know, uh, we all love something in the business. You know, last week uh, we talked about fans being so bitter. Uh, today, you know, I would love to talk about, you know, something that we would love to see in the world of pro wrestling either this year or the years to come. Um, so, you know, a lot of people want to talk about couples or, or weddings like we did a few shows ago. Uh, but, you know, it, to give the love aspect of the show, to give it the Valentine's Day feel, let's talk about, you know, things that we would love to see. I, I see what you're doing here. Uh, I, I have to say that, number one, the thing that I would most love to see in the world of professional wrestling, and we've talked about this a lot, I know, but... And, and we may have different ideas on this, but number one has to be more competition for WWE. That's right. Uh, I would love to see that too, Jonathan, because, I mean, you need a strong number two. Um, you need somebody that can kind of compete with them. Like, you know, back in the day, WCW and WWE, uh, it, when you have competition, it, it's best for it, it's best for business, you know what I mean? So it keeps everybody on their toes. Uh, you don't get silly little segments that, you know, somebody just wants to throw out there. This time when you put stuff on TV, you know you're trying to compete with the other guy uh, and you want people to tune in, you know? So, I mean, a, a strong number two wouldn't hurt. And Jonathan, do you think, I mean, uh, TNA was kind of there, but never really 
that close. Uh, do you think they could step up their game now? I mean, or is it is it too little too late for them? I'll tell you, I watched the new TNA for the first time the other night, and it was since they've been on Destination America. I, I like what they're doing. It's a little bit different, but to be completely honest, I feel like the number two company that is going to – if anybody's going to give WWE competition right now, it's going to be Ring of Honor in, in the U.S. of A. All right. Yeah. I mean, uh, the new look for TNA, man, I don't I don't know. They definitely lost a lot of uh, production money. Um, you know, like from the sets, there's not that much light anymore. You know what I mean? The, the, the crowd's dark. Uh, and I, I, I get it. I understand that you're saving money and stuff. But I mean, they, they definitely have uh, fallen back. They're definitely not where they were. And, you know, they're definitely not being seen by as many people as they were. So they're definitely back in the in the backseat right now. So uh, Ring of Honor, man, I would hope... I would love, actually, to see them, you know, get a decent TV deal, something that's really national. Uh, I don't get it over by me. Do you get it over by you? No, I don't. Uh, I find in, myself... In parts unknown? Uh, <laughs> yeah, I, I find myself trying to find clips and stuff on YouTube or, you know, other other wrestling sites. But I think that they've got a strong product. You know, they've got Del Rio in there right now, Jay Lethal. They've got AJ Styles. They've got, you know, just uh, an amazing... At, Adam Cole, The Kingdom. It, it's... They've got some amazing talent, and Ring of Honor is really what I see. It's it's been one of those constants where it's kind of like a sleeper cell, if mm-hmm. you will. They're they're kind of laying in wait, I think, to pounce and give them some more money and maybe a couple more years, and we may see a definite number two in in to, to WWE. Sure, uh, that's the biggest thing I think we would really love to see is just you know another competition for WWE. Don't get us wrong, we love WWE. Uh, we're we're you know we're big fans of all wrestling, uh, but you know it, it's always good to see that other competition because I think you know like you said when there's another number two or somebody that's equal uh, to what you're seeing on TV and getting those fans and getting those uh, you know those ratings. That's you know when each other when everybody steps up their game. And uh, you just get better overall programming. So, I mean, I don't know. Maybe we would love, actually, not maybe, definitely, is that's something we would love to see is a strong number two. But, guys, if you're listening out there, as always, we've been getting a lot of tweets from a lot of fans lately uh, telling us, you know, what they thought, what, what we talk about. And we want to know what you guys want to talk about or what your opinion is about it. Uh, tweet us at a wrestling pod that's a wrestling pod um you know let us know who do you think tna or ring of honor or anybody else out there could be a strong number two for wwe in the the years to come uh let us know and we'll uh we'll respond to you right yeah absolutely i just have to mention that you said a strong number two so many times that you would think we were having tl hopper on the, <laughs> on the show today so we aren't but yes tweet us out we love to have some fan participation, so let us know who you think would be a good competition for WWE or just things that you would love to see in the world of pro wrestling this year or for the years to come. That's right. And now, Jonathan, we've talked a lot about championships uh, in past shows. We talked about the you know, the cruiserweights. We talked about the IC championship. Uh, but I personally would love to see more championship more championships either come back or just new ones created. And then I get it. A lot of people out there saying, oh, too many championships, it just ruins the product. I don't think so. I, I figure, I think this day and age, no matter what company you are, you have, you know, an abundance of guys, uh, especially WWE right now, you have a lot of guys that are just pretty much cruiserweights. Um, bring back the cruiserweight title, man, or the light heavyweight championship, whatever you want to call it. Uh, I would definitely love to see that belt or championship brought back. Um, I, I know there's several other, but would you have to say, would you love to see more championships or new ones created, Jonathan? You know, I I had a feeling for quite a while that they were going to give Rusev the uh, the European championship since he is the United States championship right now. Um, I, I thought that they would do that, and I wouldn't be opposed to that. I definitely think that NXT, their titles, like maybe – that they get the cruiserweight title down there instead of the NXT championship, and then they can come from NXT to WWE. They can do like a crossover type of situation there. That'd be uh, awesome. That'd be awesome. Like like their champion would be able to go on Raw or whatnot, and then also be allowed on NXT kind of thing, right? Yeah, yeah. So that's a great I, idea. I don't necessarily think that we need maybe new championships, but maybe just do better things with the ones they have mm-hmm. or, or do something like I said with, uh, you know, the NXT championship where it can be maybe, I mean, 
keep it keep it the NXT Championship, but let it be defended on on pay per views and Raws and 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 house shows and stuff like that. Sure. Now, like, uh, what about Zack Ryder's old Internet Championship? Uh, a few years ago, people were like, eh, "That's funny," but when you think about it, man. If you think about what you just said, you have to look on YouTube and find clips. The more it's 2015, uh, everybody's watching wrestling on something, you know, their iPad, their iPhone, the website. Uh, you're logging in, you know, watching clips on Facebook with your friends, on Twitter, you know, everybody's watching, like, at least, I don't know. 50%, 80%, whatever programming online. Uh, the Internet Championship is a great idea. Um, and I don't know. I, I This I kind of think would fit in today's world. I mean, they used to have the TV Championship, which it's, man, nobody really cares about it anymore. But what do you think about the Internet Championship? Do you think we'll ever see that created or that's just, you know, that's it with Zack Ryder? You know, I don't think that it's str- strong enough necessarily to keep its own – uh, weight going in the world of you know Raw or SmackDown or anything like that, but they do have the network, and there was the time when they had the Hardcore Championship that could be defended 24 hours a day, seven days a week. So maybe something like that where it's only network exclusive. So it could be on TV, you know, on a on a show where they're doing main event or one of those shows that's network exclusive where it could it could be defended there mm-hmm. and. Once again, I, I'm a big fan of championships in the sense that it gets new talent uh, seen or over. So, yeah, I think something like that could work, but I just don't think it needs to be on the, the main the main product. Sure, all right. Um, now, I kind of thought they would be doing this like the last few years, but uh, now that things have kind of died down. But what about even the six-man tag championship uh you know when they had the wyatts in full force then the shield uh now that you got a new day uh there's a lot of three-man groups well there was a lot of three-man groups i know they're they're kind of going away but uh i don't know would you do you think uh, that would have any place today or is it just too that's too much i definitely think that that's probably too much i think the time that that would have been most useful was back in uh the era of wwe where there were so many gangs Mm -hmm. um you know, Los Bariquas, Disciples of Apocalypse, the Heart Foundation, uh, all of those tag teams would have definitely been pretty cool to have a, a six-man championship. But right now, there's just not that many, and there's not that many wrestlers, to be completely honest. If you yeah. look at Raw, if you look at if you just look at WWE as a whole, I think this is probably one of the the shallowest talent pools that they've ever had. So. If there was a chance that we got a big boom in the business again and we had a lot more people, then yeah, maybe something that would be cool to do. Yeah, I mean, like we're talking about what we would love. Uh, you know, I definitely would love to see these championships come back or any new ones be created. But I think one of the biggest ones I would love to talk about briefly is the women's championship. Uh, now, I know that Vince loves his divas, the name. He created it. Now, like you have in TNA, you have the knockouts. There really isn't women's championship except NXT. Uh, I would love for them to have it. I mean, they have a lot of girls right now, and especially if they bring up a lot of girls from NXT, they're going to have even more girls on the roster. Uh, I I personally thought, you know, you could have the women's championship and then have the divas championship as like the IC belt. Or uh, granted, I, like I said, I know divas is like Vince's, you know, baby. So maybe if you had the divas, the main belt, or the women's, the I, you know, but I don't know as the IC belt, but then when I think about it, you know, it's the women's, that should be the number one belt, but, uh, you know what I mean? I don't know. I figured they could have both of those belts still around, but I guess we kind of have the women's on NXT right now and the divas on the main rosters, but I I always loved the women's belt. Yeah, it it was a great belt. I'm not a fan, I'll be completely honest, of the divas championship. It looks silly. It's not, I mean, you've got people these days that are legitimate women's wrestlers you've got Paige, you've got natalia and that just doesn't go with the the look like the women's championship i'm not saying that the women's championship is the end-all be-all but something different than the divas uh and it's going to be a long time before they ever do anything because they have an entire show called total divas so um but but yeah it's (laughs) there can't be any any better thing than to try to switch some of these belts around maybe maybe bring some new ones into the fold so i would love to see something along those lines in 2014 15 16 wherever we're at these these uh 
these days. But speaking of women, we should definitely tell you that Trina Michaels is going to be joining us very shortly. So before she gets to us, we want to remind everybody that we have a YouTube channel, our very own YouTube channel. That's right. And would you love to tell everybody who our guest is this week? Oh <laughs> uh, Well, this week, guys, you can check him out right now. It's none other than Mantor, half man, half tour, uh, half beast. Uh, he, you can check out the, the exclusive interview on youtube.com slash another wrestling POD. Uh, that's on YouTube. Um, check them out. We have a lot of other guests coming up in the, in the weeks to come. Uh, but you know, we try to, we try to split it 50, 50 with uh, social media. So we have a lot of guests on this show. Then we also do exclusives just on our YouTube channel. So guys, uh, make sure you head on over to YouTube, check us out and find a lot of other exclusives that you won't hear on this show. So stay tuned to that. Uh, well, today we have an amazing guest with us. Joining us is former adult film star and current pro wrestling personality, Trina Michaels. Trina, thanks for joining us today. Hi, guys. How are you? Doing good, doing good. Um, now, what people may or may not know is that you uh, starred in adult films from 2004 to 2008, but what they may not yep. know is that you were also a huge wrestling fan. Uh, do you remember when you became a wrestling fan? <laughs> Um, yes, actually I do. I, uh, I grew up in like a very conservative home. So, you know, I wasn't exposed to it as a, as a kid. And then probably around 18, which was right around the time of the attitude air. That's, uh, when I started watching it for a little bit. And I still, to this day, remember going to my first live WWE event. So that will, that will always stick in my mind. <laughs> All right. Um, do you, who were some of your favorites back then? Oh, Oh, you know, all the popular ones. I was back when the Hardy Boys were the Hardy Boys and Trish Stratus, you know, that, that, that ass bitch. <laughs> now, how did you become involved in pro wrestling? I mean, was there something that just said, hey, I have to get involved with this right now? Um, You know, I, the same way that I got into uh, films, you know, I kind of just got presented with an opportunity and it turned in. To this whole adventure um you know i was living in la at the time and i knew people connected with you know different productions and stuff and they asked if i could come do this wrestling show i was like yeah sure why not and you know i was just there for to have fun and it was cool and then after that um another like an indie show in cali was like oh you know we have this show going i was like okay cool so i started doing shows and uh, I don't know, it just took its own crazy course. I never expected it to go this far, so. Sure. Now, are there any uh, comparisons between the wrestling business and the adult film industry? Oh, yeah, I get this question all the time. Yes, definitely. Um, you know, at the end of the day, it's all it's all entertainment. You know, we're all just trying to put something out there to make fans happy, so. Um, you know, and speaking of fans, most of them are the same. <laughs> You know, the nerdy guys in the basement. <laughs> um, you know, obviously, the wrestling reaches a slightly younger crowd than I'm used to. Um, but honestly, at shows, that's never been an issue. The kids kind of hate me more than the adults do, so it's kind of fun. <laughs> hey, yeah, you, you accomplished a lot in the world of uh, adult entertainment. You won a lot of awards. Uh, is there any specific things that you would like to accomplish, maybe, though, in the world of wrestling? Is there anything that you have uh, your eyes set on uh, or, or any goals? Um, right now, um, you know, I mean, uh, I really talked about WWE, but let's be honest, my past won't ever get me there, but, uh, you know, there's still a lot of other great sh shows to be on. And I think right now I'm probably gunning for, for ring of honor, honestly. So that would be a good spot. I think. Yeah, definitely. Now you've wrestled, uh, for a lot of different promotions. What are some of the favorite mm -hmm. promotions that you've worked for so far? Um, let's see. Well, like I said, I started out in California. Um, all my promotions out there were awesome. Uh, AWS, SoCal Pro. Um, I've done some stuff in Texas, Puerto Rico, and then obviously out here in Florida. Um, right now my big one is Full Impact Pro in Orlando. So, uh, 
Yeah. <laughs> sure. I guess that's my home promotion if you want to call it right now. <laughs> sure. Well, we also just found out too that uh, you're going to be working down in Ronin, down in, I believe they're located in Miami in Florida. Can you yeah. tell us uh, what you'll be doing for, for them in, uh, in the next few weeks? Yes. Um, they have a show on February 20th um, here in South Florida. Um, I've actually <laughs> been on a couple other shows. Um, and I am currently, let's see, for them... I am working with my tag team group, The Savages. So we're just trying to, I don't know, bring something different and a little bit edgy to the to the running show. All right. Now you uh, you just said not too long ago that you uh, you realized that you probably wouldn't fit well in WWE because of your past. But if you were ever <laughs> offered a deal, would you pursue it, or do you like what you're doing now? <laughs> no, no, I would never pursue it. <laughs> um, yeah, of course I would. <laughs> um, but no, I, you know, I, I like where I'm at right now. It's, um, I'll be honest, the last couple of years have been a little hard. It's been a bit of a struggle. Um, I had a, a brief spa with uh, Dragon Gate uh, and Evolve, and uh, that kind of fizzled out. So it's been a little frustrating trying to find my place on the on the Florida Indies. But I, I like where I'm at and where things are headed right now. So pretty excited. All right. Now, uh, speaking of WWE, uh, you'll be attending uh, WrestleMania weekend in the Bay Area, and you have an upcoming yes, contest where uh, fans can win a date with you. Can you give us the details on this amazing opportunity? <laughs> um, well, I haven't hammered out you know every fine detail yet, but something to the effect of um, I'm going to hold a raffle, probably starting at the maybe the middle of February, beginning of March. Um, you can purchase raffle tickets to something like uh, you know. 10 for $5 or something like that. I don't know. Um, I'll choose some winning numbers and then the lucky fans get to hang out with me for a couple hours. Awesome. <laughs> um, maybe go to dinner, maybe go to one of the WWE live shows. We'll see. Awesome. All right. Now, yeah. but you... it, it, keep your minds out of the gutter. It's a, <laughs> it's a <TV> day. <laughs> of course, Aww. of course, of course. <laughs> Um, now you spent some time working with, uh, at the time, John Moxley, but he's currently Dean Ambrose when he was in Dragon Gate. Yes. Um, how was he to work with? Uh, he is a brilliant genius. Um, I, I honestly only worked with him on his last weekend, uh, before he signed. So I didn't get to spend too much time with him, but you know, I had a good, I had a good experience, I guess you could say. <laughs> Well, we hear also uh, you've been called uh, Moody Michaels. Is there uh, <laughs> any story you could tell us about how you got that nickname? Moody Michaels. Wow. <laughs> you might think when you meet me that I'm, you know, sweet and nice and everything. And yeah, I smile and friendly, but uh, you cross me and the Moody Michaels bitch is going to come out. <laughs> <laughs> Now, you were in in 2010, you won or you were nominated for an AVN uh, award for best crossover. Are you a little yeah. are you a little bummed that you didn't get that? Um, I don't know if I'd say bummed. I'm definitely not surprised because uh just like in wrestling, the uh suits that are in charge of everything have never been big fans of mine. You know, I don't know if maybe I just don't kissing the ass or something i don't know but uh i'm not surprised that i didn't win i do think it's kind of lame because what they consider crossover is not crossover <laughs> um you know and a lot of people that i know from the film world all they really know about wrestling is like wwe so they don't understand what i have to do to come up on the indies and, and to build my name and um, build that character so they don't really quite understand the the challenge and the fact that yeah i pretty much am a crossover it's you know i have good good shows i'm on good tag teams good stories and stuff so i definitely say i'm a uh, a wrestler who just happens to have done <laughs> films in the past all right now i i got a little question because uh yeah, um, you know China from the Attitude mm -hmm. Era. So she mm -hmm. was a wrestler, now turned porn star, and you're kind of like vice versa. Uh, yes. <laughs> do you, so is uh, what, what do you think about China? I mean, do you think she made the right choice to where? Do you think she still could have stuck around in pro wrestling, or do you think she's I don't know making it making it big now in in the porn industry? <laughs> um, 
uh, if I'm correct, she got to play She-Hulk. So, you know, that's pretty cool. Um, I, I can't say there's anything wrong with her making a film. That's her own decision and her choice to do whatever she wants with her body. So good for her. Um, you know, she probably saw it as an opportunity to keep her name out there and, you know, mm-hmm. put something different out for the fans. So cool. <laughs> Now we are, uh, you know, we're pretty new to this whole social media thing where we've got a lot of Twitter accounts, we've got Facebook accounts Mm -hmm. and all that. What are your thoughts on just social media in general uh, as the way to, to get around, uh, to talk to people these days? It seems like it can be a a little overwhelming at times. What are your thoughts (laughs) on that? Definitely. Um, you know, when I first signed up on Twitter, like, five years ago I was all about it you know I gotta I gotta post all what am I doing today I'm going here I'm going there and now I just kind of really don't care (laughs) you're gonna get a tweet from me when I feel like tweeting (laughs) so um in my personal opinion social media is the downfall of civilization but uh as a entertainer and a you know businesswoman I guess you could say it's definitely good for keeping your product out there and keeping your name fresh in people's minds. So that's a good tool if you, if you use it right. Uh, I have a question on women's wrestling because today, uh, you know, women's wrestling today on TV isn't really put in the the biggest spotlight, if you will. Uh, you know, so what are your thoughts on how women are used today? I, I guess I know we could talk about WWE or TNA or any really mainstream uh, uh, company, but I mean, do you think that they're really women are really not getting a fair shake? Because there's a lot of great women wrestling, women wrestlers too, out mm-hmm. there. Uh, how, how do you feel that they're being portrayed on TV? And I mean, what would you want to see change with that? Um. Hmm. Let's see. Well, how do I say this? Um, I guess it's easy to sexualize women. That's kind of the role we're usually placed in. Um, and to some degree, that's perfectly fine. Sex sells and, you know, uh, hot bodies attract attention. So um, that, that's fine in its own aspect. But I think there should also be the emphasis placed on these women are athletes and they're putting themselves out there the same way the guys do. So why shouldn't they get the same kind of respect? Mm -hmm. Now you're also going to be on joined uh, today by Val Venus on our show. So do Mm -hmm. you, uh, you watch, you obviously watch the attitude era. Do you remember Mm -hmm. when Val came out and he, you know, he was, kind of acting like he was in the adult film industry. Did anybody ever say anything about that? Uh, no, I, I think this would be the first connection there. <laughs> <laughs> uh, well, I'm familiar with, I don't know about everything about him, but I'm kind of a little familiar with this character. So it's kind of cool that I get to share the podcast with him. Uh, I, I see that people are saying we're both like the, the edgy people of wrestling. So cool <laughs> <laughs> all right now uh too right now what's happening is that it's valentine's day weekend if everybody's listening to this right now uh there's probably a lot of guys out there who are thinking wow how could i have trina michaels <laughs> as my valentine so a, a two-part question for you though what's what's the perfect valentine's day date maybe for you and uh mm-hmm. if there's uh Maybe a guy out there, maybe one day who could possibly, you know, steal your heart. What what would be the perfect Valentine Day for you? Just what, hmm. the perfect guy out there. What's the perfect guy, basically, for Trina Michaels? <laughs> the perfect guy does what I say when I tell him to. Um, <laughs> <laughs> um, <laughs> let's see. Um, I don't know. I I am pretty hard to handle. I got some high expectations of uh, myself, so I kind of expect a lot from the people around me too. And I need somebody that that goes as hard as I do, or as goes as hard as I do. <laughs> <laughs> um, so if you're trying to impress me, you definitely have your work cut out. But uh, as far as the perfect date, honestly, I'm I'm a simple girl. Take me to the beach. I love the beach. So that's uh, my happy place. Well, there you go, guys. If you're listening and you see Trina out there, make sure you bring her to the beach. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> and impress her, too. you got to really impress her to bring her to the beach, though. Yes. <laughs> you better bring your A game if you're trying to impress me. <laughs> well, there you go. <laughs> Lightning round. Can you name uh, either one or a few uh, 
of your past colleagues who you think would be good in the world of wrestling? Ooh, um, Phoenix Marie. That's an easy answer. Phoenix Marie. Okay. All right, now, if uh, if you could star in an adult film again with any pro wrestler, who would, <laughs> who would it be? Hmm. Let's see. I'm going to go uh, away from the mainstream. Um, I would say Caleb Conley. Oh, wow. Wow. Uh, <laughs> who is your favorite wrestler today? Ooh. I don't know. I had to pass on that one. Okay. <laughs> uh, do you have a personal favorite movie that you starred in? <laughs> um, There's always one, maybe. Always, somebody always, always has one. They're always like, all right, I like this one. Hmm. Well, there's a lot to choose from. <laughs> <laughs> and the names aren't appropriate for me to answer, so... <laughs> It's okay. Um, you know, I, I will... Uh, here, I'll, I'll give you a funny story on that one. Uh, since my birthday just recently passed, um, probably my first year in the business, I had to film on my birthday. So I walked on the set and I told the guy I, I never met him before. I walked him and I said, it's my birthday, you better do me good. <laughs> <laughs> and he did. <laughs> there, there you All go. Right. So, um... Who now that you are wrestling, uh, who would be a dream opponent of yours? <laughs> hmm. Let's see. Uh, Brittany, TNA. Well, there you go, guys. Uh, <laughs> Trina, uh, we're talking about the world of social media too, and I know you hate. And maybe loathe some of it today, but uh, <laughs> for any of the fans listening, where can they keep up with you if they want to find any updates, either Twitter or Facebook or anything like that? Can you let the fans know? Uh, yeah. Twitter is um, at Trina Michaels. And if you want to follow my wrestling storylines, you can follow at Trina Mania. Um, Facebook, I, I suck at Facebook, but I do have one and I'm trying to post on it more. So you can uh, find me there under Trina Michaels as well. Um, there's also my YouTube page, which is Trina Michaels videos at the SLM end. And that's it. I do not have Instagram or Snapchat or any of that other stuff. All right. Thanks again to Trina Michaels. Uh, Jonathan, uh, I'm back on the love boat. Um, I would love for pro wrestling to stop insulting the fans' intelligence. Uh, there's just been too many storylines, too many things going on that it's like, guys, come on, we can go online, Google it, and obviously see that you're lying. Uh, does it bother you sometimes? I mean, there, there's a lot of examples, but I mean, you guys could just, I'm sure there's been times, you know, we were watching and we were like, uh, that didn't happen. Why are they selling it like this? You know, and uh, this isn't 1980. This isn't 1990. You can't just say something and nobody can really look it up. You know what I mean? Unless you saw it. Uh, we're living in the world of the World Wide Web. You know, you can go online and look up anything. Uh, and you know, especially wrestling history. Uh, Jonathan, this, would you love for them to to stop insulting the fans? Yeah, you know, one thing that always bothered me was with Kane. They've talked about Kane so much, and whenever you first found out about Kane, it was that he was horribly disfigured because he was in a fire, and then he takes the mask off, and he's got, like, one kind of weird contact lens in his eye, and, you know, he's kind of got male pattern baldness. But there was really no no horrible disfiguring. Then they are like, well... It was all emotional, and, it, and it's just <laughs> like they they never really tie up their loose ends. So yeah. I think in, in that instance, I definitely think that they shouldn't. And and you know, you were you're speaking earlier about the Undertaker and, and Triple H. Yeah, it's where like uh, at WrestleMania, you know, they never said that he wrestled them two times prior. Uh, so you know, when you watched it, when you when he wrestled him for the third time, you know, they never really went back to the first original time that he he fought him until actually after the fact. Uh, but it's little things like that. I mean, I'm granted there's tons more stuff to talk about, and I don't want to get too much into it, but really, all in all, guys, just stop insulting the fans' intelligence, especially in the age of the, the internet, because uh, it, granted, if I hear something and I'm, if I'm not sure, 
Google it. You know what I mean? We're going to go online. We're going to Google it. We're going to look up stuff, and we're going to see that it's, it doesn't exist. Uh, and I granted, okay, you could tell a kid, uh, a 10-year-old anything, and they're just going to be like, okay, you know, they could care less. But for, for us older fans, uh, we like to, you know, we're curious, so we'll look up things. And when we figure it out that they're lying to us, uh, blatantly lying, and, you know, I don't know. It's just stop insulting the fans' intelligence, pretty much. I would love for that to happen. I don't, I'm getting I'm getting flustered the more I talk about it, Jonathan. But if you guys are listening, facebook.com slash another wrestling podcast, give us a like, maybe even leave a message on this show right now. Tell us uh, maybe some things that, you know, you wish uh, you weren't insulted as fans. Uh, or is there any has there been any anything where, you know, you felt insulted that they just kept lying to you about? I, I, I'd be curious to know what you guys have to say. So, so make sure you hit us up on Facebook as well. Um, so, yeah. I would love if you liked us on Facebook. <laughs> that, that's true. Uh, it's, the, it's the month of love because we also had brother love not too long ago, guys. Uh, yeah. Well, I, I think that during the, the era now of the WWE Network and all of this wrestling that we have in the entire world, we have New Japan Pro Wrestling. We have Lucha Underground. We have Ring of Honor. We have... You know, local promotions now that have TV time. We have TNA. We have WWE. I just think that there is a lot of of wrestling on television right now. Yeah, uh, I would love for a lot less programming. <laughs> I mean, uh, if you think about it, I, you know, back in the day, you had a show on once a week, and that was it. Um, granted, like we've just said, times have changed. Uh, I get it. But, I mean, if you count it down, like you were just talking about, you know, Monday you got Raw, Wednesday you got Lucha Underground, NXT, Thursday you got SmackDown, Friday you got TNA, uh, well, and then if you don't count Superstars or Main Event, which is still going on also, um, and then, granted, those are the live programmings, but then, like you said, you know, if you're, if you're indie fans, you got all the local promotions, too, running stuff on YouTube and whatnot. Um, there's a lot of wrestling to watch, Jonathan, and you, you kind of got to pick and choose your poison out there to, you know, what you really want to watch. I personally always watch Raw live. Um, everything else I DVR, only because I just don't have time to to watch it all live. But so I, I at least I at least try to make the point to watch Raw live. Everything else I'll catch when I can. Um, but how, I mean, do you think it's just too much? Even the three hours of Raw. Three hours, man, that's just too much TV time. Even Triple H said it in Steve Austin's podcast that, you know, he wishes he can go back to the two-hour one. And I don't know, you think that'll ever happen too, or is it just too much going on right now? I think with Triple H at the helm that you may get that sort of uh, retooling of the three-hour Raw. I I think it loses its – I remember watching wrestling back when it was two hours, and they would give you that little extra 10, 15 minutes. Yeah. And I was I was just so happy. It was just like you have, you know, you have breakfast, you have lunch, you have dinner, and then you're like, oh, I wish I just had something else, just to to be like a little morsel of something else. And that's what that 15 minutes was. Now that it's actually three full hours of programming, uh, you know, they're putting on. So let's just think about this: three hours of of Raw, two hours of SmackDown. So that's five hours. Uh, NXT is an hour, so that is six hours. Then you have um, main event, which is another hour, so that's Yeesh. seven hours right there just in WWE alone. Um, and and that's not if there's a pay per view that week. That's not if there's an NXT pay per view. Did you even count superstars? Uh, no. <laughs> See, so. So that's, I mean... Yeah, man, just, it's over, uh, like, don't get me wrong, I love wrestling, and I would watch as much as I can, but, like, where you're doing that weekly, it's gotta kill your storylines, it's gotta kill some of your characters, I don't know, like, one hour of NXT, I feel, is almost greater than three hours of Raw sometimes, uh, it's just, you know, it's the right amount of wrestling, the right amount of time, um... You know, and it, 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 there's three hours, man. That's it's got to be so hard to to come up with three hours every week for one show. Um, man, just too much to keep up with, you know. Yes, sir. <laughs> I, I I was just trying to think about more shows and how how long that they are. It's it's really gotten to the point where if you are a casual wrestling fan, that you're probably going to pick one thing. And that's pretty much all you're going to watch. So 
I do have friends that are just like, you know what, I'm only watching WWE Raw or I'm only watching SmackDown. And I think that's something that was cool back in the day whenever they had the brand extension yeah. where it was Raw and SmackDown. You actually had people that were like SmackDown – was the only way to go or raw was the only way to go and i think that with having so much um so well so little competition and so much programming that you don't get as many people watching that and when they wonder why you know like ratings and stuff are down it's because there's just <laughs> so so much programming going exactly. on exactly you're giving them too much and then like what happens with a lot of these other shows uh you know smackdown almost becomes 20 minutes uh of that show becomes you know a rehash of what happened on Raw. And then, you know, superstars and main event, you know, they're they're always rehashing angles that happened on, on Raw. Um, it, it's just almost like get rid of get rid of main event and get rid of superstars and just make a make a show that's like a, a weekly rehash of what's happened on both shows or something, you know, just where in case you missed it and you don't have time to sit through five hours, you can watch an hour and watch all the highlights of every show or something like that. But... You know, that's the thing. I, all in all, guys, we would love less programming. Um, but uh, one other thing I would really love to talk about before Val Venus joins us, uh, I would love for less cartoony gimmicks, Jonathan. Uh, for example, uh, Los Matadores. I would love more reality in, in, in replacement of, uh, of this. And my whole thing is, you know, it's... I get when you, get, you give a guy a gimmick, uh, you know... Um, let me think of some of the guys out there right now. Uh, Brock Lesnar. We knew that he was a UFC fighter. You know, he doesn't really have a gimmick except for that he's an ass kicker kind of thing. You know, uh, John Cena. You know, he has a gimmick, but it's not like. Well, people make fun of him all the time, but it's not like cartoony. But when you look at Los Matadores, you know, it's just like they look like they're human Ninja Turtles with their headbands on. Uh, I they were fine as uh, the Colognes. Uh, you know, that name, the history of that name, being a tag team, you know, from what their father has done to them, uh, there was nothing wrong with that. But it, it's just like little things like this just bother me, and it's just, you know, there's no more Saturday morning cartoons, there's no more Saturday morning wrestling, uh, so there shouldn't be any more Saturday morning gimmicks, if I, if I, if I had to say. Yeah, I think that another thing that I would say is I'm not even so upset about the, the cartoon e gimmicks. I'm just upset that there isn't more depth in the gimmicks that we have. So, um, and this goes across the board. If you look at a cross section of '90s wrestling, so you know early '90s to late '90s, so you got kind of the end of the 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 '80s kind of rock and wrestling. Then that starts to the new generation, and then to the Attitude Era. Not one character was similar. I mean, you think of like The Undertaker, you think of Stone Cold, you think of Shawn Michaels, The Rock, Triple H. All of those people were different mm -hmm. characters. And now I feel like a lot of them kind of have the same thing. There isn't a lot of depth in the characters. Like, okay, so you've got Big Show, you've got Roman Reigns, you've got, um, you know, I don't, John Cena, you've got. Dean Ambrose, really there's nothing except for size and body type that's d differentiating them. Um, D Dean Ambrose is like unstable, but other than that, like they're all kind of, you know, there's not anything that jumps out at you. So I definitely think that was something that I would love to see is more um, just depth in the characters. Sure. I, I mean, once again, kudos to Triple H because – you know, I watch that show and there's nothing like I can watch and be like, I hate this or, you know, these these gimmicks are, are horrible or, or uh, you know, the timing on this is bad. And every person, man, is different. Everything you watch down there is great. And it's just, it's almost like I can't believe this is the developmental and, you know, Raw is the main roster. Uh, hopefully things change up for him. But, uh, you know, we talked a lot about love stuff, what we love to see, what we would love to see in the few next few years, this year, whenever it happens. Uh as fans, because we're both fans, right, Jonathan? So these are kind of the things that we just want to see. Yeah, this is this is the kind of thing, though, that it's a good debate. It's a good topic just because everybody's got something that they, they want to see in the world of professional wrestling. And I would definitely tell it, you guys to voice those opinions and make your make your opinions be heard. Whether it's, you know, if you like Damian Mizdow, then buy his T-shirt. If you like... You know, uh, a certain thing that's happening with the Wyatts or whatever, make sure that you're saying those things whenever they ask 
the they do the polls on WWE.com or whatever because this is truly the way that they get feedback. And you know, you get a lot of people right now that are complaining about Roman Reigns. Well, the reason that Roman's still in the spot that he's in is because there are enough people out there that have stood up for Roman and the character. So please tell everybody what you love because if not, then you can't really complain about it. That's my that's my thoughts on it. That's right. And uh, if you guys are out there right now looking for something to get your significant other uh, and you already haven't, then why don't you head on over to ProWrestlingTees.com slash Another Wrestling Podcast and pick up one of our shirts. Uh, there's three of them. There's going to be more on the way. But uh, if you guys pick up a shirt, it supports us. It helps us out. Uh, so head on over there, ProWrestlingTees.com, another wrestling podcast, uh, and let us know if you got a shirt. Send us a photo, tweet us, Facebook it, uh, and we will respond uh, with a thank you. Uh, But uh, speaking of the man who had quite the real gimmick, Jonathan, uh, Val Venus is in the house, and we're going to talk to him right now. Hello, ladies. Hello, listeners. Today we have a very special show for you. Our guest is none other than a multi-time wrestling champion, a political activist, and uh, he dabbled in porn. Please give a warm Another Wrestling Podcast welcome to Val Venus. Yeah, that's what I'm thinking right there. Excellent intro. (laughs) All right. Uh, How you doing, Val? I'm doing very well, very well. I've been busy, but I'm doing well. All right. Now, um, I just I don't know that I know a lot about your early life prior to getting into wrestling. So, um, what what was your life like growing up? Uh, it was a pretty standard life, you know. I you know I grew up uh, racing motocross since I was uh, five years old, uh, and then. You know, when I turned 18 and I started getting into wrestling and whatnot, uh, you know, it, as soon as I started wrestling full time, I, I left motocross and, and freestyle skiing as well in the winter time. And uh, so I had a pretty standard upbringing. Uh, you know, I got a brother and two sisters. My brother wrestles as well. He wrestles under the uh, gimmick name Vic Venus, and so it's it's a kind of a comedy uh, type deal. Uh, you know, in, in relation to the Val Venus character. All right. Now, uh, uh, if you could tell us, is, is wrestling maybe the first thing you ever remember wanting to do uh, professionally? No, actually. Uh, you know, I always loved professional wrestling. I thought it was uh, fantastic entertainment. You know, my brother and I, we'd, we'd watch it, you know, every weekend up in Canada. We had sat- or Saturdays, we'd have Maple Leaf Wrestling, for example, up in Toronto. So we would watch that all the time. Uh, and it wasn't until, I mean, I wrestled all through high school as well. Uh, it wasn't until, uh, I met a professional wrestler by the name of Dewey Robertson, uh, and his son, Jason Robertson, uh, is basically how I started. I started training with them, but it was one of those things where I just wanted to train just to learn how to do it because I always felt that maybe I was too small or, uh, it just, it, it was too much of a stretch to actually reach a goal of becoming a, a legitimate professional wrestler. So I wanted to learn it just for the fun of it because I always loved watching it growing up. Uh, as I got into it, I started to realize that, Hey, this is something that, you know, I, I could think I could do as a career. And then once I started wrestling full time in England, which was really only supposed to be for a summer, uh, the idea was the promoter in England called me up and basically said, Hey, do you want to come over here for the summer? This is right after I graduated high school and, uh, asked if I wanted to come over for the summer and heck, I've never been to England before. So I figured I'd go over there and wrestle for the summer and, you know, start university in the fall. Uh, what happened is I fell in love with the business, realized I could do this, and uh, I spent a whole year over in England, and that began my full-time career. Uh, you know, I didn't go to university after that. I just stayed wrestling full-time. Well, that kind of leads us into our uh, next question. Uh, you know, when you broke into the business, you spent a lot of time wrestling around the world before you landed in WWE. What were some of the highlights of your early, I guess, pre-WWE career? Oh, it's 
that's actually a really good question. Over in England, I met guys like Robbie Brookside, uh, Doc Dean, uh, uh, Dave Taylor, um, you know, uh, there, there are so many guys over there that really, uh, I guess, I guess you could kind of say were coaches. Basically, they had a lot of experience under the ring at the time, and so I learned a lot from them. And I, like I said, I wrestled over there, for, you know, full time for a whole year. Uh, so I gained a lot of experience really, really fast with that European style of wrestling. Uh, when I came back to, to Canada, I was home for about two days, and my tag partner and I went down to Arkansas. Uh, when we went down to Arkansas, we kind of fell more into an American style, so we were learning the American style again. Uh, and But we were only down there for about eight months. Uh, we came back from Arkansas. We spent about a day and a half at home after about eight months in Arkansas. And then we got our first really big gig uh, down for the WWC in Puerto Rico. Uh, and that was uh, that began a six-year stint of wrestling five days a week, every single week, all year long for, for six years straight. Uh, and at that point, that's where we really started to learn, uh, you know, basically calling stuff in the ring. Uh, and so, you know, and we were learning a completely different style. So uh, my tag partner, Shane and I, we were learning different styles, you know, right from the get go, you know, a year of the European style. Uh, then we had eight months of the American style. And then, you know, of course, six years in Puerto Rico, uh, you know, it really complemented uh, how we learned and what we learned. Uh, and of course, after that, uh, and, and Puerto Rico is, was phenomenal. I mean, wrestling five days a week, every single week, all year long, that's something that guys just don't do today. It just doesn't happen. Uh, and that's why really the WWE needs to have that developmental territory because there really is no full-time territories left other than Japan and Mexico. Sure. I mean, even, even Puerto Rico is down to a few days a year. Uh, after Puerto Rico, uh, I left to Mexico. I spent almost two years in Mexico. Uh, became world champion over there. Uh, and that's, again, learning another completely different style. Uh, and then, of course, I was bouncing back and forth between Mexico and Japan. So I, I learned a lot of different styles before I landed in WWE, uh, which is something that's uh, incredibly rare these days. Yeah, definitely. And uh, sp speaking of landing in WWE, uh, how exactly did that go about? Uh, was there you know, a phone call or how did you uh, make it in there? Yeah, so basically what happened is they brought me in from uh, Mexico City into Des Moines, Iowa for two days, and they wanted to talk to me and uh, and watch me work. So I went and did their I went and did a dark match there in Des Moines, Iowa, um, and then you know they said, okay, we really like you. We're going to send you down an offer. Uh, go back to Mexico. We'll be in touch. Uh, and at the time, you know, I went back. I still had a long time left on my contract. I had about eight months left at that point uh, in Mexico. Uh, and so they asked me to come up and do a camp that they were going to start up. And that's where, I, you know, I ran into Edge. Now, I had started with Edge. Uh, we kind of took two different career paths. He stayed in Canada and the States doing independence. And, of course, I went around to uh, small territories around the world. And, uh, you know, I didn't see after I left Canada, I didn't see Edge again uh, until we met up at the camp in WWE. <laughs> And so I spent uh, two weeks at that camp, and then I went back down to Mexico, and I guess about a week or so after uh, you know, I left the camp to go back down to Mexico City to continue uh, performing, uh, Vince called me up and threw a character idea by me, and uh, that, that was basically it. That's, I, you know, it was the Val Venus porn star character turned pro wrestler, and I was like, you don't need to twist my arm anymore. Any, I, excuse me. Any harder <laughs> than that. I mean, that's a perfect gimmick for me. <laughs> Now, you know, you said that Vince gave you the the character. How much input did you get to have on that character? Did he kind of want you to make it your own, or how did? Yeah, you know, he basically had a general outline. Uh, you know, when he first mentioned it to me, he said the Val Venus character is a character that was a former film star turned pro wrestler. And the first thing that popped into my head was Jesse Ventura, you know, the whole <laughs> yeah. Hollywood gimmick. And I was like, yeah, that's been done. And then he said, actually, Val Venus is a former adult film star turned pro wrestler. <laughs> 
And so that helped me. He basically gave out just the general outline. And of course, you know, we, uh, as we went through and developed the character, you know, I was adding things to it. Like I added the towel to it to, because nobody's ever worn a towel around their waist going to the ring. And I felt that's a perfect idea for the character. Uh, the Hello Ladies uh, cash line uh, is something I threw in there. Uh, so it was, it was developed over a period of time before I actually debuted. A lot of the development actually came out of the vignettes uh, it was the very first vignette that I did when I stepped out of the shower and wrapped the towel around my waist mm. that's when it clicked that I need to wear this to the ring <laughs> and then of course the very first vignette when I did the hello ladies I was like that clicked I need to say that every single time and then once I went down to the ring it was just on the on the fly I was just going to go down there and tell a joke but I decided to throw that tagline in there as well and say the hello ladies thing and it caught on and you know, we, we took it from there. All right. Now, uh, during the Attitude Era, you pretty much thrived in it. Uh, you know, like w- what you were just saying, you know, you said some pretty racy lines pre, uh, pr- pre-match. pre uh, Do you have any favorite lines or memorable ones that remain with you today that you, you, you just have in your head that maybe you think, you know, just funny that you loved? Oh, absolutely. I think the Rubik's Cube one was phenomenal. Uh, you know, I always love that one. And, of course, the one with uh, my right leg being Christmas and my left leg being New Year's. So, ladies, why don't you just come visit the big Balboski between the holidays? That's another one that I think really stuck out as well. So those are the two main ones that stuck out. You know, about... I'm going to say about 50% of my jokes uh, were written by either Al Snow. Well, most of them were written, most of that 50% was written by Al Snow. Oh, really? Uh, I mean, yeah, and Kane would throw a few in there as well. So about half the time I could come up with some decent jokes, but whenever I had a brain fart and I couldn't think up, uh, you know, I just, I couldn't write anything, the first person I would go to is Al Snow. He seems <laughs> to be a genius at that stuff. <laughs> now, um, the Attitude Era was known for, you know, pushing the envelope. Uh, did you ever, did, were you ever asked for anything that you thought maybe was pushing it too far or was everything pretty much good for you? Everything was excellent for me. I mean, I, I really enjoyed it. The one thing I, I really kind of was disappointed with was the fact that we were going in that, in that direction where we could push the envelope. We could shock people and entertain people at the same time. Uh, the one thing that kind of, irked me a little bit was when they decided to go PG, it basically destroyed my character. Uh, And of course, reinventing the character, it just, it never really seemed to gain traction again after that, you know what I mean? The the Val Venus character, I do not believe can thrive the way it did in a PG era. It just can't. No. Definitely. Um, Now, Speaking of a controversial character, uh, you, you've worked with Vince Russo and Eric Bischoff. Uh, what are your thoughts about working with these guys? Because I know you spent a lot of time with them kind of in the Attitude Era. Yeah, you know, I, I like them both. I mean, I thought I thought Vince Russo, you know, it was a phenomenal writer. He had phenomenal ideas when he was kept behind the camera. Uh, once he went over to WCW and he kind of got in front of the camera, I think that kind of, it took away, I think instead of putting 100% effort into his writing ability, he was putting 50% into his writing ability and 50% into becoming a talent. And I think that just diluted uh, it diluted his his uh, his abilities. It, dil- it diluted his talent, and I think that really uh, cost him. Sure. Now, um, other than the right to censor Val Venus, which I have to say was my least favorite um, incarnations of Val Venus, um, was there any talk about ever changing your character or, or maybe putting you in a different direction? Oh yeah, there, there was. It was like they wanted to do the Chief Morley gimmick. I wasn't a big fan of the name Chief Morley, but I did like the character. Uh, the problem was is it was basically uh, Stone Cold Steve Austin had taken some time off at that point, and so they decided to make the Chief Morley character the right hand man with Eric Bischoff. And so things were going fairly well for a short period of time, and then uh, you know Austin came back and he needed a spot. And uh, he couldn't perform, and so they put him in that spot and turned me back to being Val Venus again, which, I mean, if we're not going to put 100% into doing something, then we should never have started it in the first place. And so that kind of irked me a little bit, but, you know, it's one of those things, what can you do? Yeah, definitely. Uh, now, you won several championships in the WWE. Uh, was there ever one that was your favorite? Yeah, definitely the IC title, the Intercontinental title. 
Uh, you know, it's, it's always been some of my favorite wrestlers have held that title from Mr. Perfect to um, Ricky Steamboat. I mean, it, it's uh, Macho Man. I mean, just great perform, great in ring technical performers. Uh, you know, always seem to go after the IC title. And so that's that was always a title I wanted to win, and I got it twice. And so, yeah, I was happy with that. All right. Now, you left WWE in 2009, um, and then you went on to do some independence and even ended up in TNA for a while. Um, is there any chance that we'll get to see the big Valboski back in, you know, any of those major companies in the future? Uh, never say never. Uh, as far as as far as you know, getting back into full time wrestling, I've got other things on the go right now, so that's not even on the radar. Uh, I do know, you know, every once in a while, I, I do miss performing. Uh, so you know, it's it's I can definitely see myself wanting to perform sometime in the future, maybe again. But right now, I've just got too many other things on the go. And uh, you know, it's it's one of those things where if it happens, it, you know, I'll, I'll know it. If it happens to me, if if I get that itch to really get back into the ring and do another year or two worth of a run, uh, you know, it's something that I have no no desire to do at this point in time. But never say never. That's for sure. All right. Uh, now uh, we constantly hear about uh, the other side of pro wrestling, the backstage politics, if you will. Uh, were you ever a victim of uh, to, to the politics of pro wrestling? Uh, I believe I was at some point. Um, you know, it's. It's not something I like to, uh, to to get into too much. You know, if if I notice that you know writers I want to write for other people, and you know there's some uh, ass kissing going on there, it's like whatever. You know, it's something I didn't really care about. Mm-hmm. I try to stay away from that politics as much as possible. Uh, at this point in time, I mean, if I ever went back there, it, it would definitely be under a lot stricter conditions than, you know, back back when I was wrestling full time, it was like, just tell me what you want me to do. I'll go out there and do it. Mm-hmm. You know, mm-hmm. if, if, if I ever went back, it would definitely have to be uh, some uh, incentives. That's for sure. Now, uh, speaking of politics, we're going to get on to a different, uh, different type of politics. Uh, you've been actively involved as part of the Libertarian Party. Um, what do you feel are some of today's biggest problems in with regards to U.S. government? Oh, wow. Man, you just opened up the Pandora box on that one. <laughs> uh, I would say, you know, first and foremost, the Federal Reserve, uh, the private Federal Reserve has to go. I think the coining of currency should be put back into the hands of Congress. I think we should be backed by a commodity. Uh, you know, it doesn't really matter what the commodity is. Obviously, I would prefer the dollar to be backed by gold or silver, but anything is better than nothing. And right now, it's backed by nothing. Mm-hmm. Uh, you know, it only maintains its value. And it, it, I can't even say it's maintained its value. Since 1913, the dollar's lost over 98% of its value. Uh, so it's not holding its value at all. Uh, but it's backed by nothing. The only thing that really holds it up and gives it any buying power whatsoever is faith. The fact that you have faith that you can take that dollar bill and walk into a store and buy a loaf of bread with it. Of course, if we study history, it's happened over and over and over again. Every single fiat currency collapses. And, you know, to, to watch Americans get up and go to work every day and uh, think everything's hunky dory, they watch the, the Super Bowl, they watch wrestling, they watch boxing, MMA. Everything's fine. Everything's you know hunky dory, and nobody's taking necessary um, moves to protecting their buying power. Uh, and the the real concern now are the people that have worked thirty and forty and fifty years to save a million dollars for retirement, and they want to live off the interest. And you know, in a period of five years, once super inflation, super hyperinflation hits, that million dollars won't buy you a, a loaf of bread. You lose everything. And, you know, nobody believes that will happen in America. It's absolutely going to happen in America. And we're getting close to that. It could happen tomorrow. It could happen 10 years from now. But we're real close to that collapse coming. And it's just a matter of time. Nobody knows when it's going to happen, but it's going to happen. It's, you know, the fiat currencies don't stand strong. So the first thing I would say, we need to get rid of the Federal Reserve. We need to give the uh, the authority to coin currency back to Congress, and it needs to be backed by a solid value commodity. 
So that would be the first and foremost. That would end a lot of the problems right off the top. Uh, the second the second thing I would do is I would get rid of social programs, uh, government-run social programs, not privately-run social programs, but government-run social programs need to go. Uh, I would abolish all forms of direct taxation, so income tax, inheritance tax, corporate taxes, business taxes, things of that nature, uh, I'd abolish right away. Uh, you know, government doesn't have a right to steal people's money. And that's just, you know, the way I feel. And I think that would definitely empower citizens to uh, really take control of their own destiny and, and really move forward in their own lives. I think you'd have a lot more people retiring earlier. I think you'd have a lot more successful businesses. I think you'd see uh, the the unemployment rate come down to almost nothing. Uh, anybody that wants to work will be able to work. Uh, and I, so I, I, the Federal Reserve needs to go. Uh, government-run social programs needs to go. And we need to back our currency by something of value, some kind of commodity that holds its value. Wow. Uh, you know what you're talking about. Uh, do you think you'll ever run for public office? Uh, never say never again, but, uh, you know, at this point in time, I'd never get elected. Uh, I mean, if I was going to run and say, hey, we need to get rid of all these taxes, we need to, um, you know, back our our currency by a commodity, uh, corporations would be funding crazy amounts of money against me. Uh, you know, they benefit from a fiat currency. Uh, they benefit from social programs. They don't have to pay their employees as much in that case there. Uh, it's so it's it's one of those things where I just don't think a, a libertarian uh, like me could get elected. And the only way I'd get elected is in Canada anyway, as I am a Canadian citizen. <laughs> However, I do fully support the idea of Fox News uh, correspondent Judge Napolitano, uh, Andrew Napolitano. I would absolutely support him. Uh, if he decides to run for president, uh, I think he would be uh, even better than Ron Paul. Uh, I think he's, he would be the man that could turn America around. Of course, if he ever did get in, and I don't think he would, I think corporations would fund against him hugely. But if he ever did get in, I can completely see him being assassinated at some point in time, for sure. <laughs> now, um, fans may not know this, but uh, Glenn Jacobs, or Kane, is also a libertarian. Um did yeah. you guys did you guys really get into it or do you guys still talk talk about uh politics a lot? Yeah, yeah, we do every once in a while. Uh, you know, I talk, reach out to him every once in a while and uh you know, we chat. When I first met Glenn, he was a uh, kind of a he was a Republican, but he was more libertarian leaning, I would say. Uh, and when we started debating, and I'd debate with Al Snow all the time and and Kane would come into the debates. Uh, you know, Kane is a real smart guy. Uh, Kane was indoctrinated the same way I was, where, you know, you, you're just indoctrinated to believe in government. Uh, I didn't start learning about libertarianism until I left high school and started studying it on my own and started to realize that, whoa, there's another side of the coin I was never taught in school. So Kane was victim to that same kind of indoctrination. And when I started showing him what I had learned, I only showed him a little bit. And the next thing I know, he's buying book after book after book, all these incredible books that, that I've already done read, and he became a libertarian monster. And uh, it was phenomenal to see. I mean, he's a smart guy that likes to study, likes to really understand the uh, the inner workings of different programs, how government works. And uh, he got into studying Austrian economics, which is absolutely phenomenal. And, yeah, he's a, he's a huge monster of a libertarian now. Uh, other than being a libertarian, you are also uh, pushing for the legalization of marijuana. How did uh, you get involved in this issue? Yeah, absolutely. And that's one of the reasons I won't do anything with WWE right now as well. Uh, until they stop finding guys for, uh, you know, THC in their system, I, I just, I've taken a stand. Uh, I understand their, their position as a corporation. Uh, they say they want to follow the law. Well, I'll tell you how it came about was, you know, I used to be anti everything uh, up until I was about 28. Uh, and of course, you know, I had, by the time I reached 28, I'd already had uh, several injuries. Uh, and of course, it was a, the doctor's uh, recommendations were always the same anti inflammatories and pain pills. And so, you know, every time I got injured, it was anti inflammatories and pain pills. Well, after I had shoulder surgery, uh, I had six screws, uh, you know, put into my shoulder. Uh, you know, I was on those pain pills and anti-inflammatories for three months straight. 
And uh, once I stopped, I remember waking up in the recliner after about three months and I had slept the whole night for the first time in three months. I didn't feel any more throbbing in my shoulder. So I stopped taking the pain pills. And a day and a half later, I was in the fetal position in the middle of the living room floor, covered in sweat, but ice cold and just sick as a dog. And it was going, my body was going through pain pill withdrawals. And uh, it was, you know, probably lasted about two weeks, about the first week into those withdrawals, it was getting so horrendous uh, that I was, I was dying to go back to the doctor and get it, get another prescription for more pills just so I could feel normal again and get rid of the withdrawals. And one of my friends had said, just smoke weed, man. And at the time I'd smoke weed a couple of times just recreationally, but didn't know much about it. Didn't, you know, I was like, it's not going to work, man. I'm sick as a dog. And sure enough, I tried it anyways. I still had the withdrawals, but weed made it so I didn't care that I was going through withdrawals. I had no desire to go to the doctor and get some more pills. Uh, and it helped really helped me power my way through those withdrawals. It lasted in total about two weeks. After about two weeks, eh, it was about another month before I got my energy back. But if it wasn't for marijuana, I for sure would have gone back to the doctor to get more pills just so I would feel normal. I wouldn't feel sick anymore. And so that's when I noticed that, whoa, I didn't need rehab. I didn't need, you know, any kind of, uh, you know, pushing to power my way through it. All I needed was to smoke a little bit of weed here and there. And uh, it really helped me get through those withdrawals. And uh, that's when I said, wow, there's some medical benefits to this. And I started studying. And once I start studying something, I get into it, I mean, full bore. I was reading everything I could read on cannabis. I was, uh, you know, watching all the documentaries on it. And I start, you know, looking, reviewing the studies that have been done on cannabis and then reviewing the studies themselves as well, how they were done, who, who funded these studies. Uh, Cause if you, it, one thing I did notice is a lot of the negative studies that were done on cannabis were all funded by federal agencies. All the positive studies were done by private universities all over the world. And so I noticed that there was a bias in these studies. And that's when I really started to become angry at how government was uh, basically funding studies to keep marijuana illegal. And it wasn't that they wanted to keep marijuana illegal. It could, turns out that they want to keep hemp illegal in order to protect big oil, uh, in order to protect big pharmaceutical companies, the big cotton industry, the lumber industry. Uh, so they use marijuana and demonize it as a way to keep the real competitor illegal, which is hemp. And so that's when I really started to become passionate about it and started learning all the other benefits from cannabis. And now I, you know, I'm a huge fan of cannabis. I think everybody should be allowed to grow it uh, without any rules, regulations, or restrictions. Uh, and so that, yeah, that's, that's how I feel about cannabis. I think it's the best thing ever. Uh, I don't even take Advil anymore. I just use cannabis for everything. I use it for recreation. I use it for headaches. I use it for pain. I use it for anti-inflammatory effects. I use it for everything. Nice. Now, um, it's, this is a sad part about this, but, um, you have lost some friends in wrestling due to prescription pill pills. Like you were talking about, um, do you think we'd have less deaths in wrestling if they were a little lack more lax on uh, marijuana use? Absolutely. Hands down. That's one of the reasons that, uh, I've kind of taken a stance against going back to, or even, you know, we're even offering myself up back to WWE. Uh, and one of the reasons is, uh, they find guys $2,500 every time they pop cut, they, uh, pop for THC. And so what do guys do? Well, they just get a prescription for opiate based pain pills and they continue taking pain pills. Uh, if they pop for hydrocodone or oxycodone, they just have to show a valid prescription. I've done it. And you get a letter in the mail a few weeks later saying, congratulations, you passed this drug test. And so guys don't, you don't utilize cannabis. Instead, they utilize uh, a, a drug that's, you know, killed a lot of my friends, killed a lot of my colleagues, and, uh, and, and they avoid cannabis, which can do the same thing for them as the pills can, and they'll wake up every single morning, and they'll probably get the best night's sleep ever. Uh, so basically what's happening with WWE is they tell me that they're a corporation, they have to follow federal law. And I can understand that, but their actions are in fact telling me that following federal law is in fact more important than the health and well-being of their talent. 
And so it's, it's a fact and it's government that puts WWE in that position because if they allow guys to use uh, marijuana indiscriminately, uh, you know, they can be fined and, and, and I mean, massively from the federal government. Uh, and so it's the federal government that puts WWE in this position. And it's one of those things where I understand their position, but at the same time, they should be taking the lead on this issue. They have the money, they have the power to influence Washington, and they should be saying, hey, you're forcing us to put following your law over the health and well-being of our talent. And we feel cannabis will be better for our talent, for those that choose to utilize it, instead of big pharmaceutical medications. Uh, NFL is now taking that lead. NFL is sitting down and saying, let's examine the cannabis issue. There's been enough players that said, we don't want to use pharmaceuticals. We want to use cannabis. It's healthier and it's better for us. And it does the same thing. And it does it without any negative side effects that are going to put us six feet under. Uh, and so the, to watch the NFL at least sit down and consider cannabis uh, for their players is, is is an incredible move forward for cannabis, uh, but it's sad for me to watch, you know, an organization that I absolutely love in terms of WWE uh, sit back and just say, "Ah, oh, we're just going to keep fining guys twenty five hundred dollars," and not even consider the fact that cannabis can be utilized in a very healthy way uh, for for their talents. Uh, so it's a sad it's a sad stance. It's the federal government that puts these corporations into those positions, and uh, you know, I really wish WWE would stand up and actually blaze that trail by saying, hey, we want to examine this. We want to do tests. We want to see uh, what happens uh, going forward in terms of allowing our talent to use cannabis instead of pharmaceuticals. Nice. Uh, Marijuana legalization had some victories in 2014. Uh, Do you think uh, this will continue in 2015 and so on? Absolutely. Absolutely. Uh, there's a huge push down here in Arizona. We're actually uh, drawing up a uh, an initiative now that we're going to vote on for 2016. Uh, 2016, that'll get voted on, and uh, you know, there's a real good chance that January 1st, 2017, it'll be 21 and older. Uh, also, there's a bill going through the uh, through the state house right now here in Arizona that's trying to totally decriminalize it. So we may even have it decriminalized even before we vote on it in 2016. Uh, and of course, there's a bunch of other states that the uh, the MPP, which is the Marijuana Policy Project, uh, they, they're the ones that funded the initiative both in Colorado and Washington, also in Alaska and Washington, D.C., uh, and of course, Oregon as well. Uh, they're funding, I believe it's eight other states, with Arizona being one of them as well, uh, for 2016. Uh, so I think you're going to see a lot more, uh, a lot more of the uh, the walls of prohibition crumble. Uh, I mean, it's already crumbling at an accelerated rate, not just in America, but all over, all over the world. Uh, so I think that this is something that everything's moving in the right direction. It's just not moving fast enough for me. I want it legalized today. Nice. Now, uh, other than marijuana, what are some of the other issues that you feel strongly about? Like, I know that, um, you know, you spoke about the reserves and stuff, but um, your thoughts on, like, GMOs or any of those things? I'm not against GMOs. Uh, I'm really not. Uh, I, I would prefer not to have, like, genetically modified corn and things of that nature where they, I guess, pot to the plants are actually genetically modified to grow most of their own pesticides. And so I'm not a big fan of that. Uh, but I am an absolute fan of the free markets. And so uh, what I do not like with genetically modified uh, uh products is the fact that companies, the, the main company that's producing these is strong arming farmers into meeting their demands and putting them under contract, keeping them indebted. Uh, and of course, they're, they're also trying to squash organic competition. Uh, I'm against, uh, you know, squashing any kind of competition and having a monopoly. Right now, Monsanto has a monopoly over your grocery store because 90% of the food in your grocery store is genetically modified and, and produced by Monsanto uh, or Monsanto contracted farms. Uh, so, uh, you know, I'm completely against uh, monopolies. 
Uh, I don't think this Monsanto should be using government to maintain their, their dominance in the industry uh, because they, I mean, basically if you have a farmer that agrees to sign on with Monsanto and grow genetically modified corn and the next door neighboring, neighboring farm grows organic corn, any seeds or anything like that that float over into the organic farm's property, Monsanto can now come in and seize that property. And that's just, I mean, that, that's just, it's theft and it's, it's, it's criminal. And of course, what can you do about it? They, they're backed by governments. Uh, and so, yeah, I'm completely against uh, monopolies in, in genetically modified uh, foods. Uh, I'm all for competition. I think organic uh, growing farms should be able to compete with genetically modified farms on an even keel. Uh, so I'm not against GMOs. I'm just against their uh, their use of government to squash their competition. Uh, it's it's a it's a mob. It's a mafia. Is what it is. It's a it's a government protected. Lightning round. Who is your favorite president of all time? Oof, man. And I know you're from Canada, uh, so maybe even a Canadian president or American president. <laughs> I really don't have one uh, other than Ronald. Uh, excuse me. <laughs> other than Ronald Reagan. Oh man. Yeah, I, I would have to. If I had to choose one, I would have to say it would be Ronald Reagan. Uh, I think you know he didn't get done exactly what he wanted to do. He he absolutely spent a lot of money. Uh, that, but I don't think that was him because the way he campaigned and the way he talked, uh, you know, he had different feelings on certain things. Uh, you know, I like Carter's uh, desire to want to, you know, legalize cannabis back in the 70s. Uh, but I do not like Carter's economics or his social programs at all. Uh, I like Reagan's economics, but I mean, let's face it, the, the, no matter what president you have in power right now, the corporations and the big central banking cartel runs the show. Uh, so yeah, that basically, I mean, well, when you're asking me what my favorite pres president is, uh, you know, I can only basically tell you who my favorite is based on their own personality and not on what they do because what gets done is controlled by the big central banking cartel and the big corporations that grow up around that banking cartel but if i had to choose ronald reagan All right. okay now uh where do you rank yourself amongst the other wrestling canadians uh in terms of uh just overall career achievements um, I would say it's, it's fairly well up there. I mean, you know, it was, uh, uh I, I, it's kind of hard to say, um, that, that's a really good question. I'm going to say maybe at least in the top third, anyway, top third of Canadian wrestlers. I'm definitely up there. All right. How about a uh, favorite adult film actress? I'm sorry. Say again. How about a favorite adult film actress? Oh, <laughs> Favorite adult film actress. Hmm. Oh, what was her name? Jasmine St. Clair, I guess. There you go. Yeah, Jasmine St. Clair. I <laughs> met her a couple times. She was pretty cool. Right. Okay. Uh, how many countries would you say you've wrestled in? Oh, man. Let's see. Well, I've wrestled all over Europe. Um, Canada, Mexico, United States, Japan, uh, Australia. Uh, I guess we're going to say at least 25. Well, all right. All right. So to this day, when you get out of the shower and put a towel on, do you still take it off like you did in the WWE? I don't put a towel on anymore. <laughs> I just run. <laughs> I run out of that shower straight into bed and uh, get it on with my wife. <laughs> no towel required. <laughs> um, have you ever used Hello Ladies as a pickup line? No, I actually haven't. Uh, never even, I uh, never even crossed my mind. I usually never even bring that up until a fan says, "Just say it, just say it," and then of course, <laughs> yeah, I'll throw it out there. But no, I've never used it for a pickup line. Well, I've used it at least twice today, so I just want you to know that. <laughs> <laughs> Perfect. I know some guys that have some real good success with it. That's for sure. <laughs> All right, how about a favorite munchie? Ooh, favorite munchie. Hmm. I'm going to say 
popcorn. All right. Okay. And, yeah, uh, yeah, because there's nothing better than going to the movie theater and getting high as hell out of the parking lot. And they're walking into the movie theater stinking like cannabis, like there's no tomorrow. And ordering popcorn and watching the guy's face as he looks up at you and goes, wow, man. You ever thought about using perfume? I said, why would I want to dilute this smell? <laughs> and uh, what what does the future hold for you? Uh, well, uh, right now, uh, you know, we opened up Canada's Vapor Lounge uh, here in Tempe, Arizona. Um, and, of course, uh, you know, I have my partner, Andrew, who's uh, basically running that full time now. Uh, that's, that's his baby now. Uh, and so I go there and I I'm, I'm started up the Captain Cannabis show. And uh, we're doing it out of the Purple Haze house all the time. Uh, but we're going to take it on the road as well. We're going to cover cannabis cups. We're going to cover hemp cons. We're going to have tips and tricks. We're going to have grow tips for those that have authorization to grow. Uh, we're going to have product reviews, string reviews. So, yeah, I got a, you know, I, I got a lot of uh, desire to want to build the Captain Cannabis show right now. We really appreciate your time. Uh, thanks for joining us. So uh, where can people keep up with you these days? On uh, You're on the social media verse with Twitter and Facebook and all that? Absolutely. They can follow me at on Twitter at Val Venus E N T, which is short for entertainment. So it's Val Venus E N T. Uh, they can also like my Facebook page as facebook.com slash captain with a K cannabis with a K and of course show with an S. So it's facebook.com slash captain cannabis show. And then they can also follow me on YouTube and subscribe to my new channel, uh, youtube.com slash captain cannabis show. And of course, again, captain with a K and cannabis with a K as well. All right. Perfect. Uh, thank you so much for joining us today. We really appreciate it. No problem. Thank you for having me. Greatly appreciate it. So excited to talk to none other than Attitude Era's own Val Venus. He's doing great things. Always a great guy to talk to. Steve, one more thing that I want to tell everybody that I love is the fact that we have our very own website. We do? Yes. And <laughs> I don't know if you know this or not, Steve, but if you get on anotherwrestlingpodcast.com, you can not only find all of our previous shows, you can find out anything and everything that we're doing. So whether it be an upcoming show we're going to or if you want to you know, try to talk to us or find out where you can contact us, it's all there. It's all on anotherwrestlingpodcast.com. Today's show is brought to you by... TagMeADate.com, here to lay the smack down to all kinds of dating sites across the country. I know, kind of cheesy, but here's the thing, guys. For the first time ever, we have an online dating service for professional wrestling fans. It's awesome. Check it out yourself. I'm a radio DJ here in Kansas City, Missouri, and I've already had tons of success on the site. TagMeADate.com, the first month's free. So go ahead, take a look. I got a good feeling you're not going to be disappointed. So check it out now, TagMeADate.com. We want to thank you guys for listening today. Every week we create something for you to listen to and it's absolutely free. We are the Wrestling Fans Podcast because after all, we're fans also. Help us out by subscribing to our show on iTunes. While you're there, you can rate us and give us a good review. If you're looking for more AWP, then head on over to anotherwrestlingpodcast.com to find out more about upcoming guests and where we may pop up. Be sure to like us on Facebook, follow us on Twitter, Instagram, and buy an official AWP shirt from ProWrestlingTees.com. We couldn't do the show without you, so please tune in next week for <sighs> another wrestling podcast. Another wrestling podcast.